start recording, that would be great. Um, so welcome to our first attempt to do Books Sandwiched In live, uh, virtually, um, during this crazy time. Um, so thank you for being our guinea pigs as we do this for the first time. And everyone except for the panelists has been muted. So um, if you're not seeing that option to mute yourself, don't worry, you are already muted. Um, so uh, just a few things about Zoom before we get started. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, um, I'm gonna be answering those at the end of the presentation. So if you look and see the Q&A, you can type your questions in there or in the chat, and I'll look at both of those. Um, try to put them in the Q&A, but I'll check the chat as well, just in case you get them in there. Um, but I will answer your questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to put them in there as you think of them, um, so you don't have to try and remember through the whole presentation. Um, I will check that at the end. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tara Farrar to do another little introduction. Oh, you're muted. I there we go. Hit, I didn't hit that hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. I am Tara, and I work with the Friends on behalf of the library. And on behalf of the Friends of the Tulsa City County Library, I want to welcome everyone who's here today. Um, if you are a friend, then you are probably aware that our Spring Book Sandwiched In series got cut short because of the pandemic. So, when Carissa reached out and asked um, about doing some book sandwiched in events over the summer, the committee was more than happy to participate and to be able to offer some more program opportunities to you all over the summer uh, while the libraries remain closed. So thank you all for joining in. And if you are not a friend, um, book sandwiched in, uh, traditionally happens every fall and spring and the friends have been putting on books and in for over 50 years so and the friends of the library is a membership organization that is open to anyone who just loves our libraries and wants to give a show of support to the library and they've been aiding the library since 1957 so you can join the friends for as little as ten dollars a year and I like to say that's less than the cost of one book that you would have to buy if our libraries weren't here offering that service to you all. So, and that money goes toward funding programs like Book Sandwiched In, um, offering professional development opportunities to library staff, um, purchasing books that go to pre-K students as part of the first book program that we participate in and lots of other wonderful programs. So if you are interested in becoming a friend of the library, you can visit tulsalibrary.org slash friends and you can sign up there. And with that, I will turn it back over to Carissa. Thank you, Tara. So uh, I failed to introduce myself at the beginning of this. So I am Carissa Kellerby. I am the assistant manager at the Hardesty Regional Library and the interim manager at the Jinx Library right now. So this was the presentation that I was going to be doing in March. Um, so we just moved it into this format. And so hopefully you all will like it. So um, as you can see, and as you've probably been staring at for the past 20 minutes or so, is uh, the book that I'm doing is The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. So I'm gonna start by talking about let's see, the author. So Margaret Atwood was raised in the Canadian wilderness, uh, had a very unconventional childhood, um, is a very sort of quirky personality, and she said of herself, I can't remember a time when I was a usual anything. So she started writing at age 16, short stories, essays, and now that has accumulated to over 60 books, and she's won more than 100 literary prizes for those books. Um, sometimes she's referred to as the patron saint of feminist dystopian fiction, which is why I chose this photo. 
Um, she did a really interesting photo shoot with Tim Walker for the Times of London. And if you haven't checked out uh, or seen the other photos in that shoot, you really should because they're very whimsical and um, uh, really, really fun. So you should look at those. Um, her fiction as a whole often incorporates mythical or fairy tale um, images into past, present, or future worlds. And her novels characterize, are characterized by intricate plots in her storylines that have a disturbing and reflective tone. And her writing is very lyrical and stylistically complex. So we can't talk about Testaments, the sequel, without talking about Handmaid's Tale first. It was published in 1985 and it uh, is in a not too distant future, um, dystopian future, some sort of environmental disasters have led to a decline in birth rates and um, have also led to the second American Civil War. The result is the rise of the Republic of Gilead, which is a totalitarian regime that enforces rigid social roles and enslaves the few remaining fertile women. Offred is the main narrator of the book, and she is one of these. She's a handmaid who's bound to produce children for one of Gilead's commanders. Um, she's been deprived of her husband, her child, her freedom, and even her name, and she clings to her memories and her will to survive. So this book is framed as a sort of found recording of Alfred's story, and it's being presented at a symposium that takes place, I think, nearly 100 years in the future um, after Gilead has fallen. Um, so we know from the start that Gilead does end, um, but it's some sort of conference that's talking about that point in history. And when the book first came out, it didn't really generate much buzz at the time, but has been, uh, since then, has come to be known as a modern classic. And she has said in many interviews that all of the situations and events that she describes in the book have actually happened somewhere in the world, which is very scary because a lot of the things that happened to Alfred and the other characters is very horrible and disturbing. Um, so that's very sad to think that all those things actually happened. So since the book was first published, there, you know, fans always want a sequel. And the US presidential election and the subsequent women's marches that happened afterwards made the novel that much more relevant. And um, the Handmaid's costume has kind of become a symbol that I'll talk about later um, to that movement. Um, so just not long after that election, um, Hulu released the television series um, in 2017, and that just grew the fan base. And so m even more people were wanting a sequel. So when it finally came out in September 2019, it was one of the biggest releases since the Harry Potter midnight book release parties at bookstores. And I have to admit, I was one of those people who um, was at the bookstore at midnight, dressed as a handmaid, waiting for my book. So I'm, I'm one of them. Um, and to add to all of this craziness around the book, Amazon accidentally sent out their pre-orders a week before the book was actually supposed to come out. So if somebody had ordered it early on Amazon, they actually got the book a week early as well. So spoilers. <laughs> so the Testaments. It is set more than 15 years after the events of The Handmaid's Tale. And it is also sort of framed as a, um, a lecture given by someone at one of these symposiums that was kind of set up in the first book. And so this one is centered around three characters. One, uh, two are young girls. One was raised in Canada and one was raised in Gilead. 
Um, so they are sort of the first generation that has grown up um, completely under this new regime. And um, they, their accounts are written and listed in the book sort of as testimonies. And then the third perspective is from a character that we have seen in the first book and in the television show. Um, it's the infamous Aunt Lydia. And her portions are her secret recordings of her diary. So they really shed a lot of light on her complex past. We get to know her backstory um, and her uncertain future, which unfolds in some surprising ways. Um, so these three characters kind of converge um, at a point in Gilead where it's still in power, but there are signs that it's starting to rot from within. And so these three characters, when they come together, um, they're completely different people, but they each play a role in um, potentially changing the course of Gilead. Um, so one of the reasons that it took so long for Margaret Atwood to write a sequel is she knew that she couldn't write another book from Offred's perspective. She couldn't go back to that place and that time that she wrote that from. So it just took her a while to figure out who would be telling this story. And with this book, um, Atwood really opens up some of the innermost workings of Gilead. You find a lot out um, since it's told from multiple perspectives, you see a lot of the different sides of things within Gilead, as well as um, people outside of it, how they perceive it, um, and some of the resistance movements that are going on to try and get people out. Um, and so as a fan, this was exactly the sequel that I wanted. Um, I, I know that a lot of people have have said that it's too too close to the show or various things, but I, I thought that it did a really great job of giving us the same sort of tone and drive that the first book had, while also kind of filling in some holes that we really needed filled in. So the um, I'll talk about the show on the next slide, but um, this book also won the uh, Booker Prize for Fiction in 2019, along with um, Bernadine Evaristo's Girl, Woman, Other. And this is the second time that two fiction books have won the Booker Prize. Um, they actually wrote a rule after the first time that this happened that they wouldn't let it happen again, and then they just completely ignored that rule. So anything can happen in the world of book prizes. So the television show. So it premiered April 26, 2017, and it followed the book very faithfully, in my opinion, um, for its first season. Um, then after that, it, it went past the book, and uh, but Margaret Atwood was a consulting producer for the show. She doesn't have much say on what they actually do, but they do, the, the creator of the show did ask her opinion on certain characters, what he could do with them. And she, she only had a couple of pointers for him, which I won't share with you because I don't want it to ruin the testaments. Um, but he, she was able to give him a little bit of direction as to where she was going with the sequel so that the show could still go in line with that book as well. So it's very faithful to the world that Margaret Atwood created. Um, it's very dark, it's very menacing, and it, but it's also empowering in that Offred is such a strong character and she really, is just doing everything within her very limited power to take down the regime and find her husband and her child and just get out of Gilead. 
So this sort of leads to what the symbol of the handmaid's costume has become. Um, it has kind of turned into a warning um, that certain aspects of the government or the country's mindset is maybe moving in a direction that goes along with what happened to lead to Gilead in the book. Um, there have been signs made at the women's rights, uh, women's marches that say things like make Margaret Atwood fiction again. Um, and then this Latin phrase um, that means don't let the bastards grind you down, which is something that offered finds in the first book uh, that uh, the, a former handmaid had etched into the closet um, or the wardrobe. I can't remember exactly which. Um, but it kind of becomes a motto um, for her moving forward in what she tries to do. Um, so that, these are some of the resources that I used to put together this presentation. And now I will open it up to questions. Any questions? <laughs> By a show of, of hands, you have a little raise hands um, option. Um, how many of you have read The Handmaid's Tale to start off with? Oh, good. A good portion of you guys. Let's see, you've got something in the chat. Oh, you've read both books. Good. That was going to be my next question. If I can clear the hand raises. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Okay, so how many of you guys with the raise hand tool have read the Testaments already? Less of you, that's okay. You just have something to look forward to now. Okay, we do have a question. Um, what do you think some of the most prominent themes are in the sequel? That's a very good question. Definitely, um, people are not what they seem is definitely a good one. Um, and also just with having the two characters, the two young girls who are the, about the same age, um, telling their testimonies of their experiences, one in Gilead and one outside of Gilead, um, just kind of indoctrination, like how that shapes you. And then once you start expanding your views and learning more, kind of how that um, I don't know, makes you reevaluate things. And then how do you think the Testament stands up as a book alone? What responses have you heard from people who have not read the first book? So I think that it could stand, it could be a standalone book. It does enough of um, sort of giving you a sense of the, um, the how things are within Gilead. It doesn't go into the detail that the first book does, um, but you get an understanding of what the different things mean um, as far as handmaids and the ants and um, just the role of, of women in general in that society and then how it's viewed from the outside. So I think it can definitely be a standalone book. Um, but reading The Handmaid's Tale or even just watching the show can really round out um, more of the details of that. And then, let's see. 
uh, I think the refugees escaped to Canada. If that is so, do you think Atwood is being super, super obvious about her view of America? Yes. <laughs> Um, in a word, yes. I, I think she is. Um, at first, it was kind of interesting, her being from Canada, that she would set her book in America. And even in, you know, 1985, when The Handmaid's Tale first came out, um, that was kind of in, in light of the things that um, the book addresses, a, a fairly quiet time in America for those issues, um, as quiet as America ever gets with issues. But um, I, I do think with the sequel coming out now and the TV show, it's a very, um, it's a very non-subtle commentary on the direction that the, the country is moving in. Okay, uh, talk about Aunt Lydia. I wasn't really surprised at her development in the Testaments, do you think other readers were surprised or disappointed? I would have to say I was maybe not surprised, but I, I thought it was awesome <laughs> the way that her character uh, ends up being in the Testaments. I, she stick, sticks really true to how Lydia is viewed in um, The Handmaid's Tale, but you just find out a deeper meaning behind why she does what she does. And I, I don't, I haven't heard from anyone that they were disappointed in Aunt Lydia's character. Um, she's kind of a fan favorite, um, especially in the show, um, the actress who plays her, whose name escapes me, just does a phenomenal job. And she's kind of one of those characters that that fans love to hate. Um, and so her development in the Testaments, um, I feel just really lends a whole lot more depth to her character and just strength to her as well. And I don't want to give away too much. So I I'm not going to say any more than that, but it, Aunt Lydia's awesome. I'll say that. <laughs> um, do you think the resistance efforts shown in the sequel parallel what's happening today with Black Lives Matter and other movements in a similar, uh, that some of the events leading to Gilead also parallel current or recently past events? So let me read that again. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think resistance efforts shown in the sequel parallel what's happening today? So I, I think yes. Um, as far as the, the resistance that's happening in the Testaments um, is, is being done more secretly though. Um, th there are protests that, that happen and, you know, people definitely show their viewpoints, but as far as openly helping people escape from Gilead is not something that they do, um, just because they'll get killed. Um, which, you know, not to say that's not happening, um, with what's going on today, but, um, it's much more of a, an organized underground movement in the Testaments. Um, but I do think there are parallels between some of the attitudes that are promoted um, today in this country and some of the ones that end up uh, leading to a totalitarian state in the book. And the next question, I haven't read the Testaments. Do you think it will lead to another book? I don't think it will, um, just because I know that Margaret Atwood um, doesn't particularly like sequels. And so that's another reason why it took her so long to actually 
sit down and write the testaments um, and really, you know, figure out where she wanted it to go. Um, I think she may just let the television show um, be sort of the the rest of the story. Um, she does have at least one trilogy, so it's possible, but I, I'm not holding out too much hope. All right, that is the last question. Does anybody else have a question? All right. Well, thank you all again for tuning in to our first virtual book sandwiched in. Um, we are going to have two more, um, one on July 6th at the same time, and then the next one will be on July 20th. So be sure to tune in to those, and you all have a great day. Thank you for joining us.